Hey, how's it everyone? Um, and welcome to a technical overview of Apache Flink. Um, Archie asked me to join the, the streaming series um, and specifically talk about Flink. So Flink is something I've been using with the GovChat team for the last couple of couple of weeks and or months and before that a little bit um, on some other projects. <clears throat> So it's something I've done a bit of a deep dive uh, into in the last in the last while, and um, I thought I'd give you a sort of like a technical overview of of what it looks like, um, maybe how it's different to some of the other streaming technology that we've looked at, um, um, and yeah. So I've pre-recorded this. If anyone wants um, to ask any questions, I think afterwards is probably the best time to ask questions. Okay, so let's just, um, from my perspective, have a little bit of a reminder um, as to as to streaming and, and maybe the kinds of different things you're gonna find in a, in a streaming architecture and maybe how it all kind of fits together. Uh, this is certainly my model. It may not be perfect, but this is kind of how I see stuff. So, so where Kafka sits, where Nat sits, where Flink sits, um, Spark, Kinesis, all those kinds of things. So if we break up the sort of streaming world, um, I, I kind of see it in, in, in about four, four different layers, and I'll quickly draw them up. So typically at the bottom, you have something like a, a commit log. And, and this is important in any streaming technology. Re really what you want is you want this, this commit, this idea of a commit log. So you really... You're really collecting events as they um, <clears throat> as they occur over time, um, and ideally, there, there's a few properties that you probably want from that commit log. Um, things like immutability are probably good, so you, you shouldn't really be able to go back in time and change events. S sometimes you may want to do that, but typically, um, commit logs should should try to be immutable. Um, and when they are immutable, there's a whole lot of cool properties um, that 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 you end up inheriting so so as soon as you base your 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 processing on an immutable commit log that means you kind of don't need to ever go back and look at old records because you can, if you've already processed them they're, they're kind of done they're, they're, there's no need to ever go back and look at them there's typically also no need to go back and query them um, <clears throat> so immutable is pro probably a good thing um, other other things might be maybe distributed is maybe a good thing as well. So, so typically, commit logs are are unbounded, or they have the capability to be unbounded. That means they they typically have like a good a, a sort of starting position, but then they they may grow unbounded, which kind of means, and I'm not sure how to draw it, but I'm going to use a, a round bracket to show unbounded unboundedness, um, and so that means. <clears throat> that if they grow indefinitely, probably an idea of, of, of making them distributed so that you can scale them over time. Um, it's probably a good property. It, it, it's not something that you need, though, um, in order to do streaming. But 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 that's kind of the, the lowest level that you need in, in streaming, I, I would think. Um, on top of that, you probably need to be able to consume and produce to this commit log, right? consume and produce. So that means being able to write to it as a consumer, probably to the end of the commit log. Um, and then as a consumer, you probably want to be able to read from that commit log, right? And and, and this, this is very much the lowest level um, API uh, to that commit log that you need. Um, and that kind of makes sense, I think. Then Above that, what what I I would call stream processing. So stream processing are so if you think about the consumer and producer API, they, they're typically very simple. So it's something like put record makes sense, right? So you would want a function available as an API in this layer that can put a record onto uh, the commit log um, or, or write record or whatever you want to call it. On the consume side. <coughs> You probably want to be able to read a record, right? Read a record. And different technologies, you know, may have different fancy stuff about how consumers work, how they fan out. Potentially they have different partitions. 
that kind of stuff. But, th but these are low-level operations being able to write one record and read one record and process it. Um, ideally, there, there, there's a couple of, um, of cool guarantees that you could have here. Um, for example, you may want to um, have this layer be able to deal with where consumers are in the stream so that if a consumer dies at some point um, or is restarted or whatever it is, that it carries on from potentially a particular point in time. That, that may be a guarantee that you want down here. Um, so being able to do these things uh, statefully on the consumer side typically is, is, is certainly a property that could be valuable. Um, and you may, have, you may have other kinds of guarantees here, things like um, at most once. So you can kind of, uh, oof, can't spell, at most once at least once and exactly once. Um, so, so these are cool guarantees that could work down here and we may explore these later on. Um, but this is kind of like if you're using a database you have the ability to um, ha have some kind of like transactional integrity around reading and writing records onto this commit log. Um, but as you can see, it's a very low-level layer. Um, so as, as you're streaming, you're probably going to have these sort of more higher-level requirements. And, and that could be things like, I want to be able to take and, and, and do something like a map. So that means like apply a function over all the elements on, in, this, in this stream, right? Um, and so a map, we kind of know what map looks like. Map takes, you know, from, from one element to another kind of element, right? So it applies a function. It's a function that, given an element, will produce some new kind of element. So so that's pretty cool. You may have functions like filter. And, and you can imagine, like, filter and map are probably quite easy to implement in terms of read record below. You know, like, a map function is just going to read a record and run that function for every element that it gets out of the read record and then whatever that map function produces it will do a write record onto some other stream potentially something like that so map and filter um uh, they, they kind of make sense and they and they, they seem quite easy to probably implement within a consumer and produce api but there are much more interesting ones um such as things like reduce and, and these are still pretty simple i suppose reduce uh fold aggregate and, and and those are still kind of element wise but then you may get some very interesting ones like join a whole lot of interesting stuff around windowing which could be things like hey i want to know for all the elements in the last hour which is the maximum value in that you know in the in within that one hour window and that's probably starting to become quite complicated as to how you may implement that in terms of a consumer and producer uh, type of API. So, so that's why I put this at a sort of a higher tier called stream processing because I feel that these are sort of like that higher level productivity, higher level functionality, right? Which really allows you to be quite productive in terms of writing solutions. So, you know, as long as you've got your data sitting in a stream, you can work at this higher level, run those operations on that stream, and really not care too much about how the consumers and the producers fetched and stored records back onto it. Um, just kind of writing high-level code that we're, that we're used to. And, 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 of course, it gets quite complicated. So, as you know, as you run a map, um, as you write a map function, in, in your code, that obviously has to get mapped down to like a put record, read record type of interface, but that itself runs upon potentially a distributed commit log underneath. So, so you can imagine that, that that a map function, even just a map function, which seems so simple, running across potentially you know hundreds or thousands of of machines within a single commit log could become something that's quite quite complex. Um, then. I did say that there were four tiers, and, and there is kind of another tier that I see um, emerging, which is, and I've kind of run out of space, but I'll squash it in here, which is what, what I would call sort of like developer experience, experience 
sort of API. And and if, if you've ever looked at something like Apache Beam, is a really good example of this. And maybe developer experience is kind of the wrong name, but really what Apache Beam is trying to say is it's saying that actually out in the world, there's a bunch of different cool stream processing libraries like Flink, like uh, Kafka K-Streams, like, um, like Spark, uh, Apache Samza, etc. That's that sit into this tier three sort of layer that potentially there, there, there's like a compatibility idea that could sit at a higher level than that even. So... Um, so if you think about it at, at this sort of layer three level, three there, these are still very much specific APIs um, written for a particular technology. So it could be this is the K-Streams API for Apache Kafka. And, and that would require that you write them in Java or Scala. You can imagine that, and, and, and then for example, we've got alongside, we've got uh, Spark, which supports Python, Java and, and R, uh, and then you've got Flink, which supports Java and, Spa, and Scala again. Maybe you could produce a higher level API like um, Apache Beam, which then you can write your stream transformation code in a Beam sort of interface, and then depending on which runtime you target down in layer three, it will be mapped uh, down to that particular technology. So, so really, that's what I that, that's that sort of fourth tier, um, and and I call that developer experience because I think that's really what it is. It, it's a developer who potentially wants to use Flink, um, however doesn't necessarily want to write Flink specific stream processing code. He wants to just write this sort of high level um, Apache Beam code and have that translated into the particular runtime. And that could mean that potentially in time, he wants to move that pipeline to Apache Spark or move it to uh, Kafka K-Streams and there would be less work in moving. So um, I, I, I'm not here to really like go and review what Apache Beam looks like, but I think that's really the, the kind of promise. Um, I'd say today uh, it's, it's kind of mixed as to whether it's delivering on that promise, but I, but I think that's something that that, that will that we'll figure out in time. Okay, cool. So th those are the the four layers. Um, let me just put those in. Layer two, layer one. So le let's go and just plug in some names here so this sort of feels familiar. Um, so uh, I'll just change the color. So if, if, if we go and have a look at what sort of, potentially what sort of technology sits at layer one, you've got stuff like uh, Kafka for sure. So the, the, the sort of fundamental Kafka topic idea, so Kafka topics, Absolutely, which are um, what the brokers store and persist to disk and the ability for them to, to create a, a commit log is absolutely down there. Um, we've got NATS, which we've, which we've seen last week. NATS would sit down here. And, and this is really the NATS. I'm not sure what you would call it, but it's really the NATS, um, not necessarily the NATS streaming layer. This is really just the NATS storage layer. So maybe you call that NATS messaging or something like that. Um, messaging. Messaging, messaging, messaging. Anyway, um, other commit logs could be things like, hey, S3 is absolutely a commit log. Um, well, it, it, it can behave like a commit log, let's say, um, as long as you don't break those rules. So if you don't go rewrite old files, S3 can totally be a commit log. Um, Hadoop and HDFS could absolutely be a, be a commit log. Um, Kinesis is absolutely a commit log, etc. So, so you can really see that at this layer one, you've got um, a whole bunch of different options uh, downstairs. As we move up into the API land, um, Kafka once again has got its um, consumer producer APIs, consumer producer. Uh, Kinesis absolutely has got its um, AWS SDK, which allows you to put in get record, put record and get record equally well. Um, 
on, on for something like S3, you'd have to write your own kind of API, uh, or you'd have to build your own thing, which maybe breaks things into different file names with different timestamps, etc. So I suppose you could have custom stuff there. Um, Hadoop, probably something quite similar. I, th I think that net streaming may live here. So net streaming is 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 that layer on top of of nets, which implements the sort of idea of a of a stream. Um, and, and there's probably a bunch more. So then as we move on up even further into more of this high level stream processing, you absolutely, you have something like Kafka K-Stream, K-Streams or K-Tables, um, that's kind of what they call them. Um, there's really nothing really in the Kinesis world that gives you the stream processing, but maybe Kinesis Analytics does. Um, I haven't looked at it. Maybe Kinesis Analytics does i'll put a question mark there um but but then you've got other cool stuff like spark spark for sure lives here uh, flink absolutely lives here um samza etc so so what you can already kind of see is that flink and spark really do not come with a commit log they, they kind of need to rely on a commit log out there but what they do is they produce that library of processing functionality on top of an existing commit log and then up at the top we've already talked about beam I'm not really sure of any others um, up here um, so that's that, that that's kind of just putting some technology names into things and I may and and I think some of these lines are quite blurry you know maybe net streaming I'm not sure actually maybe net streaming actually fits more into category one uh, more than category two I'm not I'm not all that certain um, it could also be that um, uh, for example Hadoop may sit at, at the higher level I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure but that's kind of where where I see things split Oh yeah. So actually, as 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 I look through this now, I I realize that I've missed a whole category of things which live up at um at uh, at category number four, which are things like k k SQL, um, and in Flink there's something called data data uh, table SQL table something. There, there, there's something in the Flink world that also gives you an SQL type of idea. So so when I talked about developer experience there, really what I'm saying is like different, potentially different choices of languages that you could write kind of stream processing in that will then be kind of compiled down to that low level stream processing code to the maps, filters, reduces, etc. that will then run upon those um, run upon those stream processing libraries, if that makes sense. And, and, and there are, as I point out, other examples like KSQL, which is something uh, that comes out of um, Confluence implementation of Apache Kafka. Um, and Flink SQL comes with its SQL uh, interface. And I actually do think that um, SAMHSA potentially also has a SQL interface. So it, it's effectively to say that once you have these um, once you have functions like map, filter, reduce, fold, join, all that kind of stuff, those lower level um, sort of functions available, you can then start to write higher level languages like SQL um, on top of those. Okay, so enough th theory for now. Um, let's have a look at what the what, 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 how Flink was used within the GovChat uh, project. So, so Flink was used not, not in, in, in the core of GovChat. At, at, at no point does it like process messages actually coming from the, uh, fr from the WhatsApp channel, or whatever. That, that was all really implemented using, uh, Lambda functions and, um, and AWS Lex, um, and an SQS, et cetera, that kind of thing. Um, Flink was really used, um, for the analytics part. So as, as messages are flowing in and out of GovChat, they also get written to a Kinesis stream, um, and and really that's where the lambdas um, that that's really where they touch touch sort of data or whatever. And then Flink is just really processing those messages in a sort of I suppose we could say like an offline kind of way, but really it's really very much in a streamed sort of way, um, and producing real time analytics of those messages coming in and out. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly give you a, a, a demo of what 
sort of data dashboards, etc., that we can produce. Um, and, and all of these are produced using Grafana querying an influx DB um, time series database. But that time series database is being updated in real time by Flink processing messages off of a Kinesis stream that is being written to, or in fact, a number of different Kinesis streams that are being written to by um, either GovChat lambdas or um, the Department of Health forms or the form portal writing, uh, SAS applications, etc. They will just write to a Kinesis stream and Flink is analyzing that. But, but I'll draw that out to get a better idea. So as, as we can kind of see um, with any kind of Grafana thing, we can kind of go, so we've got like a last 24 hours view. We could go to like the last hour view and we can, every time we refresh, we can see that this data is kind of coming in uh, live. So that's kind of up to the second or depending on depending on how um, fast we can process that stream. Um, so this is just sort of messages over time. And here you can see the number of requests handled. These are WhatsApp messages coming in and out. In this period, in the last six hours, we've processed 1.2 million messages in and out. Uh, there's been 76,000 different unique visitors. And these are all queries running against an influx DB. If we go back to 24 hours, it's quite an interesting one. You can see the sort of overnight slump and then over this morning from about 6 a.m., uh, traffic starts to build up um, and then sort of quietens down towards the evening again. Um, and, and, and that's quite, quite, quite simple graphing, I suppose. Um, another interesting analytic that that Flink is um, that that Flink actually produces is for each message that comes into uh, into GovChat it can reconstruct a session so if you imagine that GovChat is just really a messaging system it, it processes one message one message via WhatsApp or Facebook at a time right so however if we, if we wanted to analyze the entire session for a particular user to figure out that user's sentiment um, against GovChat, we'd have to reconstruct those sessions, if that makes sense. Um, and, and so that's something that 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 that, that Flink is able to do. Um, and, and I'll take you guys through that example in a bit more detail. So really, if, if you imagine a stream of messages, and, and as you can see, there's millions of them, all in a line. Some of those may belong to Tom, right? And But they're not all grouped together in the same place. There's like, Tom might start talking to GovChat uh, sort of, you know, at, at, at minute one and then send another message at minute five and then another one at minute uh, eight and then another one at minute 10. Those are all part, you know, those could be considered all part of the same session. And so we would like to be able to pull them all out for Tom, all those four messages and reconstruct a, what we'd call like a session that he's had. So maybe he starts out, he says help. And then later on, he says he'd like to fill in a SAS application. Then he gives his address and then he decides, um, you know, to look at COVID stats or whatever it is. Like that's quite interesting. And we'd want to be able to analyze that session as a unit, not necessarily just the individual messages um, in order to potentially derive something like a sentiment. And that's exactly what we've got here. So these are those sessions coming in over time um, where we reconstruct the session. And, and in fact, you can see an example of like what a session looked like. So this this individual with this uh, contact number started out saying SAS related services. Then he said status. Then he gave maybe a reference number. Then he said, thank you. And then he said something like, I can see is submitted. And so we've run a sentiment analysis over that. And um, that says, um, so we've used AWS uh, Comprehend and Comprehend said that was a positive sentiment. So there's, so wherever there's a negative and a positive, we've graphed those, all of the neutral and mixed sentiment messages we've thrown away. And really what we're doing is we're just graphing the proportion of negative versus um, versus positive and producing them onto, onto a graph, which is pretty useful. Um, we can also break up the different kinds of requests coming in. That's interesting. There's also, um, the split and count of SASA particular forms, and this actually comes via a different stream. This is, uh, uh, the, although it, the, the messages hit GovChat, this, this data stream is actually coming from another Kinesis stream, which is produced to by the DynamoDB that is capturing each individual SASA application. So that's like a completed unit of work. Once a consumer completes, like he fills in the whole SASA application, that might be you know, potentially 10 messages or whatever it is, and then he gets redirected to a form and he completes the form and he presses submit. That goes into a DynamoDB and the DynamoDB change log is being pushed to Kinesis, which is 
um, and then I've got a Flink job that's running and, and extracting statistics out of that um, out of that Kinesis stream. So this is the, really the split of new versus submitted versus in progress of those SAS applications. Um, there's the ability to then split it by channel. So we can say, well, these are the ones that came via Facebook, not very many, uh, versus the ones that came via WhatsApp, which, you know, quite a lot more. So um, that's really just splitting it by channel. We can do more interesting things like saying, well, for each of those applications, can we graph um, from which province did the individual originate? Because it obviously it's part of the application form. They have to put in, they have to drop their location or whatever it is. Um, and then we can split that by province. So we can see that, you know, Gauteng has got the lion's share, then uh, KwaZulu-Natal, it looks like, Eastern Cape down there, uh, Western Cape should be somewhere there at the top. Um, and then even in more detail, which is now splitting it by municipality. So you could see that, um, I don't know, the Ikuruleni municipality down there. You can see the city of Johannesburg is about there. Uh, what is the city of Cape Town, etc. So, So this is very interesting. And this is all being extracted out of or being queried out of InfluxDB um, after it's being processed by Flink. And I'll take you through that detail now. Okay, so let's um, let's draw that up quickly uh, so we can get an idea of what that looks like. Let's just move this stuff. Oh no. Uh, let me move this to the side. Why won't it? Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to quickly draw it. So, so, so we know that Grafana um, is is drawing this stuff. So. Let's just put Grafana over here. So Grafana is querying Influx, Influx DB, and it could be some other time series database. I, I think that's fine. We also in GovChat query other data sources, but for for this kind of data that we just saw, um, Influx DB was, was was a good choice, um, and 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 that's fine. All of those kind of queries work like that. Um, however, what's happening is we've got a bunch of Flink jobs, many of them. So we've got jobs that are updating this thing. So effectively um, grabbing data out of streams um, or out of commit logs um, uh, and then running a streaming uh, transformation over those over those elements and updating particular fields within InfluxDB. So so the first one that we saw was just sort of sort of messages, um, which, which is just a raw stream. So so from Kinesis, we we have on the Kinesis side. Sorry, we have we have two streams that are that are interesting. The the one is just messages, which is really just the, the you know the message in message out. So uh, if if I say hello to GovChat, there will be a record stuck in Kinesis saying Tom you know said hello. Um, and potentially some other stuff, M metadata around that around that chat. Um, the other stream we have is from the form portal, which is really the SASA application. So going into another Kinesis stream. And effectively, we've got the, the, these jobs. Job number one is the one that is just re reconstructing like the totals. It's just counting just raw messages, just saying how many messages have we got, on what channel did they come? Did they come from... Um, uh, Facebook from from WhatsApp etc. Who did they come from um, etc. And really that's kind of job one. Um, and and I'll and I'll go through these in a bit more detail. Job number two is doing that sentiment uh, piece. So it's analyzing. So it's reconstructing sessions first of all. And I talked about the sessions. And then it's analyzing. Uh, and then it's running the, the each session against AWS Comprehend and then updating in FluxDB. So but really it comes from the same source queue source. Um, uh, source stream from Kinesis. And then we've got that third job, which is producing the stats and dividing it up by provinces, etc., um, which is really job number three. Um, so if we go and take a look behind this, this is just really for information. Um, what's happening in, in GovChat, really GovChat has got a bunch of of Lambda functions. And really, these Lambda functions are doing the actual work. So maybe they receive a request uh, via API Gateway from our service provider. Lambda then does a whole bunch of things, but most importantly, kind of invokes Lex. 
in order to do the sort of chatbot type of functionality. It may invoke other things. There, there may be other lambdas being invoked. Lex itself can invoke other lambdas, um, etc. And this is all really part of the core value proposition of of what GovChat does. So, so many kind of things happen here. Many lambdas get invoked like that. Uh, API Gateway can invoke different lambdas. Uh, there is a database that lives here somewhere so that those lambdas can uh, reconstruct their sessions, etc. But once they're done, and they've got they've had they've received an incoming message and they've prepared an outgoing message really all this lambda does is he just writes that single uh, request response pair to a kinesis stream and then is done um, something similar i believe happens on the on the sasa side although um, it's not lambdas really that's producing messages into these into the sasa kinesis stream really it's a dynamo so there's a Dynamo DB um, sitting somewhere, and there's a. I'm I'm not exactly sure what you know inserts and updates into that Dynamo DB, but what we've used is a Kinesis uh, Dynamo Dynamo Kinesis CDC type of strategy here, just to say any change that occurs inside that Dynamo DB to any um, item or element within that table, please invoke this Lambda function. I think it just uses uh, something called triggers, AWS Dynamo DB triggers, and that element just gets written directly to a stream. So very little transformation happens. So effectively what's what's occurring onto the, what's arriving onto the SASA Kinesis stream are just the uh, the new item and the old item. So it's really, I think they call them new and old images that are written to, um, that, 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 that effectively is recording the change log of DynamoDB. All right, let's talk very briefly about how Flink um, is deployed or and, and sort of how it runs. Um, because it is potentially a little bit different to Kafka, and I think we are a little bit more familiar with Kafka. Um, so let me make some more space here. So effectively, Flink is runs on what's called a resource manager, and effectively, it is a clustered clustered technology. So effectively, you have you, you have the idea of something called the job manager. Um, and, and, and just one of these job managers, it's a highly available one, but it, but it is just kind of logically one of them. And then you have many task managers. So you can have many task managers, and I'll abbreviate it to TM, attached to a job manager, uh, something like that. So you can obviously add uh, more task managers over time, and you can obviously remove old ones, um, and really that's how it works. So, um, so Flink, when it runs, it runs within the context of these task managers. So you you have the idea, you have the concept of a job. So you submit a job to a job manager. The job manager breaks that job down into a list of tasks, and those tasks get distributed down to the task manager. Um, so a job could end up having you know, more than one task and they may be distributed down to the task managers and, and where they're kind of wired up um, together to, to run. So that's from a sort of physical, physical perspective. Flink runs really well in uh, in in anything that clusters like uh, like Kubernetes or in Hadoop uh, or Yarn or whatever um, because it's really easy to run um, run this run this configuration. Everything kind of automatically wires up quite easily. When you launch a task manager, you just have to point it at a job manager and it will register itself. Um, w within each task manager, each task manager offers. Um, or when it runs, it offers the job manager something called a list of slots. So when you define a task manager, you, you kind of specify the number of slots that that task manager offers. And each slot then is available to the job manager to sort of put a task during a job execution. Um, so effectively what happens is 
each job. So if we if we zoom into a job, a job might have have many things happening. Um, it may it may source may start generally. I, I think I'm pretty sure all jobs have to start with some kind of source. So that source could be go and fetch data from a file, or go fetch data from Kinesis or from Kafka or whatever. And then generally you take that source and and you and you define a whole lot of um, transformations on that source. So you might say, hey, I want to map uh, map that source, and when you know, for each record that I get, I want to record dot to upper that thing, or uppercase it, whatever it is, and then maybe I want to filter those records by, um, you know, R dot starts with, you know, maybe it starts with the letter T or something like that. And this, uh, these are obviously just examples, um, but that is effectively what or how you define a job a whole lot of different transformations when when flink loads this job so uh, and of course then there's probably a sync or well, zero or more you can have many syncs so maybe we're reading from a file read from file and maybe the sync is to write to s3 or something right um, that's fine so th that's really our job definition what Flink then does is when it loads this thing, it converts it, it sort of figures out how to turn that into a into a DAG. So it kind of breaks that into an expression tree, I suppose. It says, hey, from my source, I've then got like a map type of operation. And then from the map, I go into like a filter type operation. And then I go to a... Uh, I don't think we added anything else, but we, we added a whole lot of other different things here. These things can also split, so you can have operations that split the DAG. Um, and then at some point, this one maybe went to a sync, and maybe this one goes to a different sync. Like, that's totally possible. You can have multiple syncs. Um, that would be fine. And then... Uh, so Flink may say, cool, that, that's my DAG. However, and, and what I've got is I've got a task manager with 20 slots available to me, right? Or maybe across my whole cluster, I've got 20 slots. You, you can then define with this job, you can, you can set your parallelism. So you can say, I want parallelism equal to three. And what you're telling Flink is you're saying you, you, you would like it to run at most three uh, tasks for every kind of like transformation. So, so that would mean, that, that would say to Flink quite clearly that actually I would like three maps here. I'd, I'd like that to run on kind of three threads, right? I'd like the filtering to run on three different threads and I'd like this thing to run on three sort of threads, if that makes sense. So it's not that it kind of spins the, spins three jobs up all doing the same thing, it actually splits each task out and then wires up the wires up the arrows between them. It's also very smart about this. It doesn't do it quite as stupidly as I've written it here. It kind of knows that map and filter, you know, the the output of map straight into a filter that to to try and disconnect those two things would be kind of idiotic. Um, and it would combine them into the same task, or it would at least put them very close together so that they wouldn't need to traverse the network. It kind of knows that a map and a filter um, right after it is something that needs to happen probably in the same thread, right? So it, it wouldn't do it quite as idiotically as, as, as what I've done here. Um, but then other operations may, they may be split out. So if you've got um, operations like uh, like join or like key by, which is like you want to, you, or windows or whatever they are, those things probably can't be chained directly. So it's got this really strong concept of of chaining, of chaining tasks together um, to make them optimal. You can, of course, also govern the, the actual chaining of, of tasks. But anyway, it would break these all out into different tasks. That's task one, task two, task three, task four, task five, task six, task seven, task eight, task nine, etc. And then it could then when it distributes them across task managers, it would just say, hey, that one there is task one, that's task two, that's task three, task four, and it could spill over onto other task managers, 
no problem. So effectively, that's really how Flink works from a distributed and a clustering perspective. Okay, so I want to take you through um, a, a, a very simple job. So we'll start with one of the GovChat ones. Um, let's, let's actually dive into the source code. So uh, remember earlier I talked about three different jobs. The first one was uh, parsing the, in, really just parsing messages, I suppose. I think well, I called it classify intent because the idea was that when we load them into GovChat, we have the, le the, the intent that Lex invoked along with it. Um, so it's, it, it, in fact, it's probably badly named. But if, if we look at the, the, the job definition, and this is written in Scala, in Java, it would be very sim very much the same, I would think. I think Scala is probably a nicer language to write uh, Flink in because there's a whole lot of um, implicit typing that you don't need to deal with with, uh, with Scala, whereas, you, whereas you'd have to be more explicit um, in Java. But, but it kind of maps down to exactly the same uh, language. So effectively, we, we we define a class called classify intent job, and it's really just a main method. So this is absolutely a Java main method that just gets run. Um, there, there's a whole lot of stuff going on here, uh, which is really just setting up the environment um, for for Flink. So so importantly, you've got uh, two different uh, modes with Flink. The one is called uh, data stream, uh, I mean data set mode, and the other one is called data stream mode. So you've got data set mode, which is really dealing with a bounded data set. So that means it's a job that will run, it has a, uh, it has a very fixed start time, and it has a fixed end time. So at some point that job will actually be complete and done. So that's where, you know, if, 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 if you were processing a, in a single file or something like that, and you just wanted to run it once, you, you would probably, you, you would use just the data set mode for Flink. Um, I'm obviously interested in the streaming side, and so I've run a stream execution environment. So this means it, it, it's really a job that will never end. You run it at some point, and it'll run forever. Um, and really, the only difference is um, using this stream execution environment, which is a, a Flink um, a Flink object. Um, we set a state backend. I'll talk about state a bit later, but that's actually a very important uh, part of Flink. So these processes are stateful. That means that while they're running, they can maintain an internal state. Um, and if the job fails at any point in time and a new Task, a new slot or a new task takes over from a from a previously failed task. That state will be restored back into the memory of that uh, of that task. So, so there is the ability to to have persistent state between tasks, task execution. Um, and so, when it comes to that, you've got to configure your job with a state backend somewhere where it can st store and maintain that state, um, as well as you configure what's called its checkpointing. So, how often it should be saving that state, um, and and what the guarantees are around while that checkpoint is occurring, um, because it could be that if you experience a failure while a checkpoint is being written, what would you like, would you prefer that you uh, reprocess those messages or or would you prefer that you don't, right? And so, and so there's a way of configuring Flink for that. Um, the parameter tool is effectively a way to pass parameters into the job um, and, and that's really useful for things like credentials or for any other configuration that your job may need. Access, you know, configure, uh, access keys to, to AWS things are uh, is, is certainly useful. It could be region definitions or it could be connection strings or, or whatever it is that your job needs from a configuration perspective. Um, configuration is not quite as simple as just injecting it into the job. Remember that configuration has to be distributed to every task uh, that gets distributed. And so, so there is this ability um, to use this object called parameter tool and actually be able to uh, figure out which tasks require which configurations. At the moment, I just set global. So I just pump whatever configuration comes into my job. I set that globally against all of my task managers so that they can all, um, uh, they, they can all read that same configuration, but you can you you, you can have control over that um, potentially, and you could derive other configuration, etc. Um, 
th this this job uh, is reading from Kinesis, so there's some Kinesis specific configuration around where do we want to start uh, in the stream. I've set mine to start at a particular offset in time within the stream, so there's some earlier data that I'm not interested in. I'm starting at a particular older point in time, so I'm just configuring that kind of stuff. Um, there's this very, this is one of the most important uh, pieces of Flink called the time characteristics. So there are, there are three time characteristics in, 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 in Flink. And really these are probably the most important when you are doing things like windowing and joining. So it, it's really, it's basically telling Flink how to deal with time or where it should get time from. Um, processing time is where we're just saying to Flink, hey, we just, just get the time out of your own internal clock as you're processing stuff. That makes sense. Um, and, and because my particular scenario is I'm just reading out of Kinesis and I'm just pumping it straight into InfluxDB, I really have no, I have no need to window or to join uh, at all as long as I get the timestamp correct from the element and write it into Influx. Influx will deal with all the grouping and joining, etc., as part of the query. So from a, so I've just picked a, a very simple time characteristic, which is just processing time. The next example I'll go through deals with event time, which is a much more interesting one. I've set the parallelism to 20, so that tells Flink, hey, for every, every task that you uh, that, that you spin up, I'd like I'd like you to sort of hit a ceiling of 20 of, of those things. Some tasks you, you may only be able to spin up one of, um, but where Flink is able to, it will try to spin up up to a maximum of 20 uh, per task type. Uh, setting the watermark interval, I'll get to this um, a bit later. Um, and here really we're starting with really what is the definition of the job, which is um, starting with a source, so I would like to source uh, data out of this govchat prod message stream. I just would like it in strings um, and create this object called kinesis source. And if we look at the type of this, um, which I think I do like that, we can see it as of type data stream of string. So everything in, everything in Flink when it comes to uh, building that DAG, um, that job definition is we're going to be working with these data streams. So it's, and, and it's strictly typed, so it's a data stream of type string right now, because that's all we're reading off of Kinesis. Probably the first thing we want to do, so, so so then we write our definition. So the first thing we want to do is we know that coming out of Kinesis, we get a list of records. So when we read from the Kinesis iterator, we get a list of records. So that string is a JSON uh, string, but and in it is a structure, uh, where there's an element called records, and within that there's a list of these of these records. Um, so, so really, and and I'm not going to go into the heavy detail of that, but effectively what we're doing is for every element, uh, each one of these string elements that could turn into potentially ten individual records, right? So that's a flat map operation. That means for each element there could be zero or many um, output types. So, flat map record comes in, that's the first element, and for every record we need to uh, effectively collect them through a collector object, which is strongly typed to this type chat message. So um, I, I've got a cool function which does the parsing, we can dive into it quickly, and effectively it does some JSON stuff, and this is our own particular internal protocol, but it's effectively just reading fields out of, out of that JSON structure into a well-defined Java object called a chat message, which has got a timestamp, a response timestamp, a channel, a sender, a message, a response, and intent, etc. So, so really that just parses it into zero or many chat messages, and then we output them back to Flink through writing them to the collector. So now what we have, so we started out with a data stream of type string. After this, we should now have a, if I can get this to work, we now have a data stream of type chat message. So that, now that's strongly typed, right? Um, because all we're trying to do is write these into Influx, we could just sync them straight into InfluxDB if we like, but one of the optimizations we did is we'd actually like to say, hey, we only want to write to InfluxDB every 30 seconds. So let's rather batch them up into batches of 30 second um, 30 second intervals effectively. So read, 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 chat message after chat message until 30 seconds is over. Consider that a batch and then write that whole batch to Influx. So Influx has the ability to, when we write to it, 
it has a batch writing mode where you can write more than one data point. And that's just an optimization to keep this nice and efficient. So we do lots of reads off Kinesis. They get queued up into memory. And every 30 seconds, we take that whole batch and we write that whole batch to InfluxDB. Um, so in order to define, it's, it's very simple. We just add a time window um, to that stream. And we say, hey, it's 30 seconds long. In fact, we don't need all of this. We can just say 30 seconds and include that. Um, and, and, and that'll do it. So effectively what the type is of that now, it is an all windowed stream of type chat message. Um, what we do with an all time windowed stream is we need to aggregate. So we need to tell Flink somehow, okay, cool. So you've got this. So, so at the end of that 30, 30 second period, it's now built up a list of chat messages. We need to tell Flink how it should reduce that into back into a data stream. So the way we do that, and, and it's all very time, um, I mean, very, uh, very easy to do and we can see the operations so we can see oh okay so with a time windowed stream we can call an aggregate function or we can apply on it we can also specify an, a, a lateness on it which is quite interesting um, there's a way of evicting messages out of that window you maybe you just want to find hey I just want the maximum number um, I want the maximum element in that window um, and it could be by something so so like you've kind of got a whole lot of different um, transformations you can apply to a a, a windowed stream um, for, for my purposes I just want all of them uh, I want to aggregate them and really what I want out of that is I just want a list of those chat messages so I've got a cool little function called list aggregate function which effectively just implements an aggregation where it takes an element and it effectively just outputs a list of elements. It's as simple as that. You can see how simple the implementation is. Um, it should actually be something that I think is built into Flink, but doesn't seem to be. So now what we have is we have a, now a data stream of list of chat message, um, if that makes sense. So it's really a data stream of batches of chat messages. And then effectively we just give that to a sync function. So this sync function in FluxDB sync chat messages, if we're going to have a look at it, it extends a sync function and we just implement the invoke method within it. It gets given a list of chat messages, um, some context, and this is effectively the, the implementation of how I write those points um, to influx and this is very specific to how influx uh, needs its values um, but effectively we build it up into this batch points builder um, and we add those to the batch and then at some point in time we go influx db dot write that batch please so so that will write 30 second batches to influx db at a time so that's the entire job definition. It's really, actually, that's all the logic. So read the stuff of Kinesis. Kinesis has kind of already batches messages into, into single writes. Um, effectively take them out of that and parse them into a kind of a POJO object. We want to batch them into 30 second groups, aggregate them back into um, a list of type chat message, and then write them to influx. So it's really simple. And, and, and that's just a super, super simple um, implementation um, of, of a job. So I'll show you quickly what that looks like inside um, inside our job manager. If I, sorry, if I can start the, uh, I'm going to now just quickly connect to the Flink job manager on our cluster. Um, so Flink provides you with a cool web UI when your job is running. Okay, so if we're going to look at our cluster, we can see that there's three jobs running. The, these are those three jobs that I've talked through. Some of them have been running for a long time. Um, others have been are, are more recent. This is the one that we've just looked at. So if we go back to the code down here, you can see that we name it. So when we say environment.execute, we give it a job name, classify chat intents, including lag and Facebook batched. Um, we'll see that guy down here and if we click on him we even get an ex a little diagrammatic view of what the DAG looks like from Flink's perspective. Um, let's just go in there, yeah. Um, 
and you, you can even kind of get some stats happening, etc., uh, down beneath. But you can kind of see how it's sort of split them out. It's able to run 20 of these, only one of these, and 20 of these. And that's the, the, the one of this is probably that time window. So when we went in our code, we said time window all. There's kind of no way that Flink can do that in a distributed way, right? There's no way of batching up. So it, Flink's implementation of time window all, and I think all here is probably the clue, that all tells us um, uh, window this data stream into tumbling time windows. There's, this operator can be inherently non-parallel since all elements have to pass through the same operator instance. Only for special cases such as aligned time windows is it possible to perform this operation parallel. So, so when we go time window all, we're saying, you know what, all of this mapping stuff, that can all happen in parallel. We can have 20 of those. That's great. So that means we can have 20 reads off of Kinesis, 20 flat maps running into potentially 200 um, elements popping out of the flat map. This time window all is they all have to pump through the same task in order to be batched. So that single task, he's just going to accumulate them, accumulate them, accumulate them. He'll probably then also do the aggregation and also do the syncing, is my assumption. Uh, it looks like the syncing can be done again in parallel. So everything up to the end of the aggregation, so once that batch is available, it can be passed then to 20 tasks all running the sync to InfluxDB. And that maybe sounds a bit wrong and probably, maybe Flink got that a little bit wrong. We don't really need 20 instances of that, right? Um, but it could be that the InfluxDB, the actual write to Influx, uh, it takes a long time and maybe it blocks for, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes or, or whatever, um, we may end up with more, the ability to write to InfluxDB in more parallel, in a more parallel way. Okay, so let's look at a more complex um, example. So I talked earlier that we had three jobs. The first one was to load messages and just really the basic properties and that's what we've been through. Um, the, the second one which was quite interesting was to run a sentiment analysis um, across those same messages but it's a bit more complex because it's not based on individual messages but it's really based on sessions. So collecting up multiple messages from the same user within the same uh, sort of period or same interval and then running in a sentiment analysis against that before loading it into uh, InfluxDB. So let's take a look at that um, at, at that example. This one is called chat sentiment and you can see I've loaded them actually into the same, uh, I've like written them into the same sort of Java project um, and with, with Flink th th this is totally fine because when you run when you run a Flink job you specify the entry point um, and Java allows you to have multiple entry points in the same jar file so that's totally fine. Um, I'm also making use of some like common uh, functions like the influx stuff and some of the you know some of like supporting sort of uh, utilities that, that we've written that's fine but you probably best practice would be to probably create a second project for each uh, each job I'm not sure um, for for me these these jobs are pretty small and so it's kind of easier to just throw them all into a single project um, okay so this project is it, I mean it's pretty much the same kind of stuff at the beginning it's a stream execution thing parameter tool uh, we're using kinesis again um, very interestingly though, th this is probably the big difference, is this particular project makes use of event time. So event time uh, says to Flink that the time that it must use is the one based on the timestamp of events within the stream, within its processing context. So whereas before in our previous job we set the time characteristic to processing time, meaning that Flink could just look at its local clock for every message that it that it was processing, for every record that it was processing, it could just look at the clock um, at, at that point in time and just use that. So when it was batching things here it was 30 real seconds uh, that, um, that, that were being used to window uh, or batch those records together with 30 real seconds, not necessarily 30 event seconds. So, so they're quite different and quite subtle, but very, very different in their um, in, in 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 the behavior uh, that you're going to do. So, I'll, I, and and I'll describe this a little bit. So, if if you think about it, what you may have is you could have messages coming into. So, so you kind of got the stream 
like that, right? Um, maybe I'll draw it like a pipe. Um, and within this, there are records being written by somebody onto this thing. And of course, the, this could happen for days, right? You, you could have someone writing to this thing for absolute days. Um, and then at some point, you decide to launch a job. And that job, maybe you instruct it to start at the beginning, start at the beginning of that stream. Now, what we'd probably want to do is when we start to do operations against these things, like maybe windowing, maybe we were starting to say, hey, like we'd like things to happen, and we are going to do that in this example, like we would like to cluster similar things together. We need this job to consider time to be based on the time of the record. So if you th if you imagine that each record has got some kind of timestamp in it, when when Flink does its windowing, we certainly don't want it to window based on his own internal clock because his clock could be, you know, out here somewhere. It might be, you know, day three, but he's processing a message from or record from day zero. So he really needs to make use of um, make use of the timestamp within the record, and that's what event time. Um, is all about. Um, and, and, we, and we'll see that now. So so this is the same, we read off that same stream. So we con we're consuming the same stream, Kinesis source. Um, we're parsing it the same way into this chat message, Pojo. Um, then because it is event time, we do have to tell Flink where it should extract this timestamp from. There's also this other concept called watermarks. I'm not going to get into now. I don't think we have time. But effectively, uh, we, 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 we're telling Flink how to extract timestamps. Um, and really, you can see the implementation is very simple. It's element.timestamp. So our Pojo object has got a bunch of different fields, one of which is a timestamp, which is a, a long, which is milliseconds um, since epoch. Um, and so we're just instructing Flink that that is the timestamp. So then its own internal uh, time characteristic is now set to each element's timestamp. Then, now, 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 considering that we are wanting, so our particular job is trying to uh, group together all messages from a the same sender, which are within the same kind of time period. Um, Flink has got so 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 we're going to execute a window against this this data stream. Um, the, this the the windowing in Flink is almost identical to the windowing in uh, in Kafka. So if you're aware of those, they're pretty much the same. There's three different ones. There is tumbling windows, sliding windows, and session windows. Uh, Flink also allows you to create your own type of windows as well. So so they are extensible, and I'll quickly describe those. Um, if we if we look at this thing never works the first time. So the 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 first type of window was that tumbling type of window. So if we imagine that this is our stream, we've got elements, records being written into it, and I'll put gaps, these are sort of like gaps in time and they're maybe all from the same sender. A tumbling window is one, and, and maybe for this example, we say, hey, we'd like a one minute tumbling window. What that would do is it would create sort of boundaries of one minute intervals and say, well, that's one window. Here's the next window, and here's the next window. So you can see they don't, in, they, they don't um, overlap at all. They're all exactly one minute long, and they began somewhere some point in time um, and and that's how tumbling windows work they're very simple so this would be window number one that would be window number two and that would be window number three um, a sliding window is very similar other than the fact that things can overlap so if that's our stream and we have that same kind of picture of elements over time, with a sliding window, you have to give two things. You have to say we, you, the, how big they are and what their, what, and what the size of their slide is. So it might have a slide of thirty seconds, for example. That would say that the the window would begin here and end over there. If that was one minute long, then it would only slide by thirty seconds. So it would slide the start of that window would slide thirty seconds beyond the start of its size, even though. It was one minute long. It would in, it would overlap with itself. The next window would then be kind of there, 
slide across this one would then slide across like that something like that so, so you kind of get these overlapping windows um, and and that's very simple so so effectively you know the same element can be in more than one window at the at, at, at in more than one window it's very simple um, and and that for things like moving averages might be very useful uh, that kind of thing um, and then event uh, session windows are very interesting and quite different. Um, so an event uh, session window is one where you say it's based on the on the on the gap between elements. So if you had this kind of thing with with a with a session window, you you would specify a maximum gap between things. So you might say I want a one minute max gap and what uh, what flink would do is it, when it first sees an element the window would open at the time of that element and then that window would remain open up until the maximum gap size so if this element the second element was at one minute and five seconds that window would close and that would be our first window when it sees another element it would reopen it would open that session window a new session window it would effectively stay open for up to a maximum of one minute and that would be our second now this gets interesting when there's more than one element so if we look at this one our, our, our window opened with this third element and it stayed open and then it discovered a new element so effectively what happened is it kind of it re-extended the size of the session for another minute looking for another element so effectively our third window would be quite a lot bigger and if there was another element in here that would reopen it it would extend the length of that window again for another minute so here you can see this is absolutely you know that the name session window is perfectly named because it really is discovering sessions uh, within things so if, if you considered that these were like user interactions or people clicking on your website or something, each click you could consider the start of a session and if they clicked again it would be part of that same session. If they disappeared for too long we could consider that session to be closed and then you would process it uh, like that. Um, and, and that's effectively what session windows are. So when it comes to us grouping chat messages together for the purposes of determining their uh, sentiment, th this is the perfect uh, window for us. Because it could be that you've got one user that talks to GovChat for 30 minutes, over 100 messages, that's, that's, that's a session of, of 100 messages, or one user that that's, sends five messages in one minute, that's also another session. So back to the code so here we're we're keying by the sender so we're saying we, we're wanting to group them up by uh, the same sender and we're creating event time session window with a gap of 60 seconds which we feel is appropriate for whatsapp maybe for a web thing a web client maybe something like 10 minutes or five minutes is more appropriate for a session but for whatsapp 60 seconds seems right then there's this concept of allowed lateness um, and this is this is very interesting because remembering that Flink is now considering its time characteristic is based on the timestamp of messages in the stream so what you could have in this example um, is effectively you may have had the situation where a an event suddenly that you read off the Kinesis stream has actually got a timestamp that is in the past so something that happened later on so maybe this one here that I'm marking with an X came from so it was at the end of the of, of the of the stream but it had a timestamp from an earlier perspective and so actually it fits in the timeline somewhere there and what you can tell Kinesis is with this allowed lateness parameter you could say hey it's okay if you get stuff that's from an earlier time as long as they're within the the allowed lateness what Flink could do is it could choose to merge these windows together and say, oh, actually, what that ends up doing is it ends up merging these two windows together because, in fact, this is all part of the same session. So it's just grouped that window with that window because this element appeared in the middle and we had, we had the allowed lateness set. So effectively, what that's telling Flink is it's saying, hey, don't close windows until the session is over but 
as well as there being an allowed lateness gap because we may have late arriving messages that could come and extend those sessions into the future. So that's quite an advanced um, use case. Um, and typically, I think we're, I mean, it's up to you, it's up to your particular scenario with GovChat. This is not really something that, um, that may ever happen when things are written into Kinesis based on incoming WhatsApp messages. We're, we're fairly guaranteed that messages are going to come um, into the stream in a, in a chronologically ordered. We're never going to really have old stuff being pushed into, into a stream. But if we did, we could set an allowed lateness and allow Flink to tolerate that. Then we group those all up using that same list aggregation that we saw earlier, which will then give us a list of them. Then what we want to do is two sort of very simple tests uh, where we want to throw away very short sessions, so where people have maybe just said yes or no or just help. Um, th those are not worth the testing for sentiment. So, so we're just saying, hey, conversations need to have at least five messages in them um, where at least one of those messages has got more than three words. That's our very simple test uh, um, of, of, of sessions that we'd like to push through AWS Comprehend. Then Comprehend itself, if we go down and we can actually see the, the method, it's this one here, where we call batch detect sentiment against uh, AWS Comprehend. It allows us to pass um, up to 25 messages at a time into the the, the sentiment detection um, method. So just to be safe, we batch up just 20 at a time. Um, we aggregate them and then we we pass them into the flat map. So flat map then is receiving a list. So, so this is like a session. So th these would be keyed by Tom. So this would be a list of messages that Tom sent, sent us and then a list of those. So we batch 20, 20 conversations um, at a time, a conversation being a list of chat message, if that makes sense. We flat map that, we invoke um, AWS Comprehend over there, and for every result that we get, we collect those into a new POJO called a sentiment analysis. So if we click through that, we can see that's what Comprehend returns us, either positive, negative, neutral, or mixed as well as the, the list of chat messages that that sentiment is associated with. So that's just kind of an internal data structure. So our data stream popping out the bottom here is a list of sentiment analysis. Uh, then we throw away all the sentiments that were not positive or not negative. Um, so probably 90% of them come back with neutral or mixed. Um, where those conversations were really short and they and AWS had no had no clue whether they were positive or negative. We throw those away. We're only interested in the ones that were clearly positive or clearly negative. So here we're filtering them. I think we're just mapping here because we want to print them to the log file. Um, this map does nothing, given a sentiment, return a sentiment, um, other than a side effect of printing them. Then we want to batch them and pass them into InfluxDB. And you can see here, we're just batching them one at a time. So in fact, we're not really batching. Um, it's probably because we get very few um, messages, positive or negative out the bottom, that we just pass them directly to Influx. And yeah, that's really, I mean, that's really it. So if we go and have a look at what the, the job looks like, it's called classify chat sentiment. Um, let's go have a look. Classify chat sentiment and sync to influx. There, it's been running for three days. If we go and open it, we'll see there's, yeah, there's a bit more of a complicated, well, it's a bit more of a comprehensive DAG. It's still actually very simple. It's still completely linear. There's no branching happening um, within it, but we can kind of understand it. So we can see here's the sourcing of messages from Kinesis as, as well as assigning of those timestamps. So you can see in our code, we've actually named, uh, just, to, just to be nicer, that each one of these transformations, you, you are able to put a dot name against, which will then allow Flink to print them a little bit friendlier. So you can see there's the sourcing from Kinesis and the assigning of timestamps. Then here we're grouping by sender and filtering for the longer conversation. So you can see that's a separate kind of task. Um, batching into 20s before we invoke Comprehend over here. And of course the batching we talked about earlier is a single, you can only do on a, a sort of single thread. So it's a parallelism of one. But once they are batched, 
uh, they go through to this task, which then can invoke comprehend, um, and you can have three of those. So, so there would be three of them doing that, that as well as the, the filtering for positive and negative, because it would be pointless in splitting, invoking the comprehend, and then the filtering. Uh, Flink has already decided that, in fact, those things are not disconnectable, and so it will run them in the same task. Then we batch again for influx, which puts us back to a parallelism of one into a single task there, and then we sync to influx again, which is then the parallelism of three. This is the count of tasks, of total tasks, so there are six of them. Six tasks, each with um, a different number of task slots taken up. So if we go and have a look at our running jobs list, you'll see there are 14 tasks in total, and they're deployed to 14 slots, is what that number tells us. I think this number here is telling us that there are six sort of, I don't know what you call them, task types maybe, or six different, uh, yes, task types probably sounds right. I know if we go and have a look at our task managers here, we can see that there are five instances of the task managers. Each one is giving us 20 slots. Um, and you can see that via the free slots here, which ones have been assigned to. And you can see, Flink tries to co-locate um, stuff close together because rather than distributing, uh, co-locating is good for performance, if that makes sense. So what it, what it tries to avoid is distributing those tasks evenly across uh, the task managers, which is maybe something like, like Kubernetes may want to do that with through infinity, uh, affinity rules, that kind of stuff is more around keeping things up and running and being distributed, whereas Flink's objective is to complete the job as fast as possible and co-locating is, is, is a good optimization, right? So instead of writing the results of one task into the network and into the input of another task, you would rather co-locate them and join them kind of in process, which is awesome. All right, awesome. So I think that's, I've just checked the time and we're kind of out of time and there's a bunch of stuff that I didn't manage to go through. So maybe we should have another session, but maybe some of the items that, 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 that are still interesting that I think uh, just in closing to talk through um, that, that require more detail are things like snapshots and save points. So with, with, with Flink, you have the ability to have these long running jobs. So for example, we've got jobs that have been running for you know maybe a week, but at some point you wanna do um, you know, maybe you want to maintain the cluster or whatever it is or or whatever. You have the ability to create save points. So so you can you can tell Flink to please save the state of a of a particular job, save it and, and stop it effectively. So that's almost like in Kubernetes world you may taint and drain drain a drain a cluster or whatever it is to empty out its internals. In in Flink you can do that and it'll save and persist its state. Um, somewhere and then later on at some later point when maybe you've rebuilt the cluster or you've done an upgrade or whatever it is you can tell Flink to then restore a job and what it'll do is it'll load that job back into memory and restore all the state back into all of those tasks so that they continue from exactly the point where you saved them. So that's really cool you can start to really manage um, jobs from a sort of like life cycle perspective. Um, uh, we we never talked about state management properly. So if you are building your own operators, um, where, where where maybe you you filter, you map, or you aggregate whatever they whatever they are, and you want to internally maintain some kind of state that takes part in that snapshotting and restoring, um, you you have to build your operator in a way that takes advantage of uh, Flink's state management framework. Um, so that Flink can maintain and, and has a handle to that state. Uh, we never talked about watermarks, so we talked about timestamps as a way of, um, of, of informing Flink about the time um, of elements within a stream, but there's the, there, there's a concept of watermarks, which are where time moves forward. So at some point in time, Flink has to say, you know what, for this stream, I can see that I've got a whole bunch of elements in here and they've got various timestamps. At some point, I have to make a decision that time has moved on um, and therefore start to ignore 
uh, elements where there is a timestamp earlier than this than this than this value, and that's the watermark. So a watermark is is actually Flink's concept of time moving. So a, an element's timestamp is 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 a point in time, but a watermark is time has now passed has moved. Um, and things happen in terms of watermarks moving, like windows only close once a watermark um, moves. And you have control over it, but it's, it, I think it's quite a dark art of, of understanding. Um, detailed operations I put there, and it's just really to look at like some of the other transformations that you can do. We never looked at a join. Um, we never looked at splitting streams. Uh, co-grouping, co-joins, co-maps. There's a whole lot of other operators that you can run on streams and, and it's worth looking at them, at each one, because it informs the way you will solve your problems using using Flink. And then um, common patterns. Um, so this I put here because I, I kind of, the you know, I think uh, uh, Chart may have, may have talked about Factorio or maybe it was, um, maybe it was Paul Z. Uh, there's a game called Factorio, and you have to deal with building items from factories and putting things onto conveyor belts. And and like the, there's there's almost emergent patterns that come out of if you've played the game Factorio, um, as, as you as you see like common problems, you kind of you kind of get good at like solving problems in a certain way. And I think with 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 things like Flink and probably with um, with with Kafka and other streaming technologies, there's like there's emergent patterns that although you have these low level things like map and filter and reduce and all that stuff, you, you probably, you know, the combination of these things, like maybe when you're joining a stream and you and you co-group it or something like that, and that way you kind of invoke an outer join uh, type of semantic is, is something that, that, that I think is quite interesting. And so I think it, it's worth talking through a bunch of different common patterns um, that that sort of add to your, your toolbox when solving things with streaming. Other than that, thank you very much. Um, if you're watching this at the tech session, um, open for questions. If you're watching this on YouTube, you're welcome to write a comment in the box below. Cheers.